I've been fortunate enough to be acquainted with Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander for, I think it's been close to 10 years when I was library director and she had some students and they were doing um, research on um, history pertaining to the city of Portsmouth. And luckily we've been able to maintain contact over the years. She's the director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for the African Diaspora at Norfolk State and uh, worked with the Norfolk Convention and Visitors Bureau to produce a detailed map and interactive website on the Underground Railroad. Also has done research on the Underground Railroad here in the city of Portsmouth. And her biggest project in the last about four or five years has been with the sesquicentennial. So I'm very privileged and pre pleased to present Dr. Cassandra Ruby Alexander. Thank you so much, Sue. That's very gracious of you. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon to hear me talk about one of my favorite subjects. Not only is it local history, but it's about the Civil War. And part of the reason it's one of my favorite subjects is because when you look at this particular history, you find that there's so many new things that you're discovering about this. We have a narrative, and here in the South, it has typically been a Confederate narrative. But the story is much, much, much more complex than that. In fact, I wanted to um, read you just a little selection uh, as my uh, preliminary one. This is from a newspaper in May of 1862, and it is um, New Bern, it was from New Bern, North Carolina, which is very interesting. And it said, and I quote, the Union men of Norfolk still held back, afraid to express sentiments openly in defiance of the rebellious spirit around them. Quite an enthusiastic Union meeting was held in Portsmouth on Thursday night. Not less than 800 were present, including many Union men from Norfolk. The course of the government in refusing to allow provisions to come there for loyal people was severely criticized, and the propriety of such a course by no means approval, approved. Excuse me. The scarcity of provisions and necessities of life is so great and prices are so high that the poorer classes have to live almost entirely on fish and oysters. The secessionists are nearly all wealthy people who can stand high prices and have laid in their stock long since. And it goes on to talk a little bit more about that. Now that's a different story than the one that we've heard. We've heard that all the whites in Hampton Roads were supporters of the secession movement, and all blacks were not. And that narrative is not true. Not only is it not true, but it belies the, the reason that the Underground Railroad in this area was so active, because you had blacks and whites participating in it, as well as the reasons that it was so well challenged because you had blacks and whites who were participating in making sure that people were captured. The story is not, forgive the pun, the black and white, but it wasn't so clearly one side or the other. And I think that's what makes the story very interesting and very human. In fact, it is it, when we limit people based on their racial association to feeling one thing or the other, to believing one thing or the other, we miss some important stories. And so I'm hopeful that a little bit of what I'm going to focus on today will help to give us perhaps a a different narrative and begin to open up that dialogue so that we can look at the Civil War from more of, from, from the standpoint of more historical accuracy as opposed to mythology. And I'm also hopeful that eventually our narrative will be inclusive. 
Um, we did, and several uh, people were involved in this, including Peggy Hale McPhillips over in uh, Norfolk, uh, as well as Troy Vallis, also in Norfolk. The three of us got together and did a map looking at the Civil War in Norfolk. Because, um, and it, the impetus was really me, because I was tired of seeing maps that either talked about the Civil War from the Confederate viewpoint or the Civil War, a little bit of the Civil War, always with blacks. The Civil War was more complex than that. And to talk about it separately was offensive to me because that was not how the war was conducted. I want to start by just going over a couple of things. And I think these are significant facts. One of them, of course, is that slavery was a very, 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 very important industry in America. I would be very happy when all the textbooks that are geared towards the K through 12 stop talking about slavery as if it only happened in the South. When slavery existed everywhere, it was a legalized system, and you would see it in Massachusetts first, starting officially in 1641, and then officially in Virginia in 1661, although we know the people were being enslaved by the 1650s. We also know that slavery was more valuable as an industry, as a, as a as, uh, uh, at the people who were enslaved as commodities. If you look at the costs and the value of slavery, it was more than all of America's industries combined. So I think that's worthy to repeat. Because there are people who have made the argument that the Civil War, oh, well, you know, it was just an economic thing. Yes, it was an economic thing, but it wasn't just an economic thing. It was an incredible, it was incredibly economic, but it also instituted a social, political structure in our society. And there were people who were insisting on holding that. In fact, in Boston, the pro-slavery sentiment was so strong that in the 1850s, Abolitionists moved some of their headquarters down to New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is where the 54th Massachusetts Regiment was, was formed, and that's why it was formed down there, because then it became a beacon for runaway slaves, and large numbers of people from Hampton Roads ended up in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The institution of slavery not only produced, of course, a lot of rice and tobacco, but cotton was king, and America produced seven-eighths of the world's cotton production. Seven-eighths of the world's cotton production by 1860. So that tells you that there were more than just slaveholders involved. You had shipping magnets. You had the textile industries. They were all involved, and it was very, very important to the nation. And that is also why President Abraham Lincoln was very reluctant to jump with both feet into this quagmire. And, and the reason why James Buchanan, the previous president, didn't want to deal with it at all, which is why eventually we would have the Civil War. Now, I keep hitting something on this. Now, I just provided this map so that you can see exactly where cotton production was. And you know that there are interstates that follow this route. And it shouldn't be surprising because these were heavily traveled routes in the South. And you see up in, let me point to it. You see up in Virginia, it really was the South Side. So you're talking about Southampton County going into eastern North Carolina. That's really where you would see some cotton production. Most of the cotton production, as you can see, is in the area of the Black Belt, 
that extends from western South Carolina all the way into Texas. And Texas was emerging as a huge slave producing state on the eve of the Civil War. And these are just a few numbers. I like to start on the same page with everybody before we move on. And you can see the numbers of enslaved people throughout uh, the upper and the lower south and in the United States. And there were still enslaved people owned by people who lived in New York, New Jersey, a few in Pennsylvania. And, be, and it was because those states initiated gradual emancipation laws. Now all this context I think is important to even understanding why we ended up in a war. And these are all the major issues that most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. Um, and, and they were really precipitated by things that we were involved in here in Hampton Roads. And one of them, of course, was the Underground Railroad, that the Underground Railroad helped to create this idea that there was a national conspiracy. In fact, the idea was there before the Underground Railroad really got big in terms of people's understandings by the 1850s. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act uh, really propelled more activity, increased activity with the Underground Railroad. It didn't start it because we know that the Underground Railroad had its, had its roots back at the end of the American Revolution. And, and Portsmouth and Norfolk were two departure points for people who left with the British during, in, the, in the aftermath of the American Revolution and the War of 1812. Some of the descendants, by the way, of people who left are still living up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. In fact, I've met some of the descendants and some of them have actually visited Hampton Roads over the past few years and have talked about how a lot of the people around here look like they do, sound like they do. Some of the accents, some of the, the um, euphemistic phrases uh, that people use. You know, one of the favorites around here, uh, people, I don't hear it anymore, but people used to say, I'm going to write my bills, I'm going to make groceries. And I, I would always be very sarcastic. How do you make groceries? But it, these, are, these are, are phrases that came out of the cultures that came together here in the area and produced some very unique perspectives and unique food ways and customs. I understand, for example, that there's a dish, and it's popular among African Americans. It's a blending of some African and and Chinese cuisines called yakamin. And you only find yakamin in this area and in New Orleans. Those are the only two places in the country that you find that particular dish. And anybody who, who, does, who has that dish and they continue to <coughs> produce that dish in North Carolina, it's usually Eastern North Carolina, and it's because they have relatives from this area. And so you look at, at these very interesting confluences that have come up. Uh, another connection, John Brown's raid. Well, there's a man, and, and I'm sure I'm related to him distantly, called Dangerfield Newby. His ancestors were from Surrey County. It seems like a lot of newbies, both white and black, came from Surrey County. And they migrated to different places. And so you continue to see Hampton Roads playing a role in, in these kinds of activities. Some of the major fugitive slave cases came from Hampton Roads, including Shadrach Minkins, and, and even in 1842, George Latimer, uh, who escaped from Norfolk. Um, the, um, what is now Emanuel AME Church, which used to be the Colored Methodist Church, had large numbers of people escaping through the Underground Railroad, so much so that there are at least some who believe that the church, when the congregation was at the old Glasgow Street Church, was burned down as a result of their participation uh, in the Underground Railroad, and they were under surveillance nonstop. And so we have all of these incidences that would eventually lead to the Civil War. We know that these four states, beginning with South Carolina, were the first to secede 
And unlike some of the mythologies that have come from the cult of the lost cause, these states clearly said in their secession documents that they were seceding because they were afraid that the Union government was going to eliminate slavery. There are no questions in, in anyone's mind reading those documents why they chose to secede. There are few exceptions, such as Virginia, that chose to secede after the firing on Fort Sumter. But if you read the secession debates, those who supported secession also echoed similar ideas that they feared that slavery would be forced to end in Virginia, and this was the only way out. Now, when Abraham Lincoln, even before he was elected, and, and you know, I should say before he was inaugurated, and, and the inauguration did not take place until March of, the, of that year following the election, because it took until December before they certified the votes. And the reason it was changed to January was because of the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover was basically wringing his hands and people were tired of waiting for him to act. And, um, and they were very anxious for Franklin Roosevelt to come in with his plan to save the country. And so after that first term, Congress voted to change the inauguration period to January of, 18, of, of whatever the year is following the election. So for Lincoln, he did not come in until March. And he said from the beginning he was not interested in making a decision about the issue of slavery. Now you have to ask, if it was just about economics, why would he have made that statement? Why would that have been important if it was just about economics? But it wasn't. It was about slavery. And slavery was all inclusive. It involved human beings. It involved a socioeconomic structure. It involved the politics of maintaining power that placed people whose lives, whose fortunes were involved in slavery at the top of the heap, the economic heap. So it was, it was very, very, it was very involved. It was very intense. And Lincoln did not want to step into it. But at the same time, Lincoln, was a good politician. He understood that sometimes the best course was to wait and see, to try to stay the course but wait and see. And when it was time to act, he would act, and he would act decisively. And we would see that with the course of the war. We know that blacks, like whites, volunteered to support their regions. And so you had, for example, the Louisiana Native Guard, which was a group of free blacks down in New Orleans, who volunteered to serve for the Confederacy. They were turned away. You had blacks up in Boston and New York and Philadelphia who organized themselves into regiments and volunteered to serve on behalf of the Union. They were turned away. Why? Because Lincoln hoped that this would be a short war. But he feared that it would be much longer. And he needed to see exactly which direction things would go. And so when he was inaugurated, this is the statement that he made, that he had no intention of interfering directly in slavery. But there were people who had other intentions. And they were not concerned about Lincoln's politics. They were not concerned about the greater view or the greater agenda. They were concerned about their personal lives. And all lives would turn on a place that was significant when it was built. Fort Monroe was built after the War of 1812, beginning in 1819. It was the, the Congress authorized that construction be started and like a lot of projects funding drizzled out then came back in and finally it was completed somewhere in the 1840s it was finally completed uh, one of the people who helped to uh, organize or oversee his construction was a young engineer by the name of robert e lee we know that it was a heavily fortified fort Typically, people talk about how the fort was created because, of course, the British went up 
uh, the James River all the way up to the Potomac River and destroyed Washington, well, parts of Washington, D.C., the Capitol, the White House, things like that. But what historians often don't talk about until recently is that they also carried away thousands of enslaved African Americans. And so when the fort was built, that was the last time until the Civil War that we would see large numbers of African Americans leaving their slaveholders. It would be the last time. And it's interesting that the fort was built in part to prevent that from ever happening again, and yet it would be this beacon of hope for African Americans to find freedom. I find the fort very ironic and the placement uh, being there at Point Comfort also, the irony runs deep and long. And so the fort, once it was built, and had never been attacked, by the way, Fort Monroe has never been attacked by anybody. It would be the place where the fortifications and the reinforcements would pour in. Why? Because it stood at the mouth of Hampton Roads. And you know, it took me a long time before I finally realized that Hampton Roads was that waterway that connected all the rivers with the Chesapeake Bay that led to the Atlantic Ocean. It was our super highway connector. And so when, you th when, when people ask, what the heck is Hampton Roads? I hope from this point on, if you didn't know it before, you can now tell people that our region's name came because of the waterways. And those waterways, when you're going from Norfolk to Hampton or back from Hampton to Norfolk, when you cross over that waterway, that's the Hampton Roads. That's the connection where all the rivers pour together into the Chesapeake Bay. So now you can tell them with some knowledge. At least you can check it out for yourself from this point on. And so Fort Monroe became that important place. And the, the ships poured in. The soldiers poured in. The reinforcements were there. And the Confederates were fearful that now that the Union government decided to fortify that fort, to build it up, to pour all of its resources there, so that uh, not only would Washington, D.C. be protected, but they knew that this would be a launching pad to Richmond, which was the, the uh, seat of the Confederacy. Then they decided that they needed to consolidate their forces. And so the Confederates would eventually burn Hampton Village. I want to show you this map because that, I think, gives you a good idea. It shows you where some of these places are. So some of this got kind of pulled over here because this should be old. Point Comfort here along with Fort Monroe. And of course the Rip Raps is what Fort Wool is. And it was a piece of land that got exposed and they decided to build it up, put uh, rocks that they came down the river from the Potomac and placed these rocks around it to fortify it. It was an inspection station during the 1850s, so all ships coming and going out of Hampton Roads that had a northern registry would be stopped at the rip raps checking for escaped slaves. And then you had Craney Island, Sewell's Point, and then all the way to the Dismal Swamp. So Hampton Village was burned. And all that was remaining were slabs of wood and so forth, which would become very, very important later on. We would also see the, the, the Union Army similarly try to burn the Gosper Navy shipyard, and not very well. There were lots of buildings that were destroyed, but the Confederacy managed to hold on to uh, a number of buildings. They also managed to uh, raise a ship that the Union tried to scuttle and that was the USS Merrimack that was renamed, once it was raised, the CSS Virginia. <coughs> and then in May, because, you know, the war started in April. By May, 
This man, Major General Benjamin Butler, was sent down to be the commander of Fort Monroe. And part of the reason he was sent is because, you know, he was a political appoint appointee. And Lincoln believed in the same ideas as George Washington, and that is try to create a government that included different political parties as your cabinet members, as key officials. Bring those people in so that you build consensus. And so uh, Benjamin Butler was a Democrat, and he was a lawyer, and he had political ambitions. And so to, to put him in an important place, but not too important, Lincoln sent him down to Fort Monroe, not knowing that he would end up making a decision that would change the course of the war and a decision that would change the face of the nation. And, and of course, Benjamin Butler really didn't know that either, even though he had actually thought about how the federal government could use enslaved people to help them. Well, two days after he arrived, he was faced with a decision, and that decision would involve three men who would go from Sewell's Point, which is where the Norfolk Naval Shipyard is, I mean, excuse me, not Norfolk Naval Shipyard, but the Norfolk Naval Base, where you see all those aircraft carriers. That's Sewell's Point. These three men would get on a little skiff, a tiny little boat. Now, I don't know if you all have paid any attention to the Hampton Roads, but you know, when you have all these different waterways coming together in the same place, you get choppy waters, and the waters are extremely deep. They're about thousand plus feet deep. And so the waves are huge and all it takes is a little wind. And if you can imagine getting in a little skiff in the dark, I'm sure there was no full moon because if there was a full moon, they would have been caught. But these three men obviously were desperate. They were being forced by their owner to work um, on the fortifications over there at Sewell's Point. And the Confederates had decided they were going to withdraw their forces and go to eastern North Carolina. And that meant that these men would be pulled away from their families who were located in Hampton, in the Hampton area. And they decided they were not going to allow that to happen. They got in this little skiff in the middle of the night and they made their way all the way to the fort. <coughs> and they went to the gate of the fort and they asked for a refuge. They asked to be allowed to stay. And they told, they were brought eventually the next day to Benjamin Butler and were told, and they told him the story and they said they did not want to continue to work for the Confederacy. And Butler made a decision, as I said, that would change the face of the war. He looked, as a lawyer, he looked at this and he said, and this wasn't new, he had been thinking about it, and he said, I'm not going to return these men because I know that they're going to go back and help in the war effort. And even though he later would write in his memoirs how concerned he was about classifying them as contraband because that's an object, he decided to use the law against the law because the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution was still active, as was the Fugitive Slave Law. And so he then took that and used it against the Confederacy by saying, if these men then are things, if they're objects, if they are our property, then that means they could also be contraband, which is property. And because they're being used, to hurt the Union government, that we can confiscate that property. And we're not then bound by the Fugitive Slave Clause or the Fugitive Slave Law to return them. Legally, the Constitution does not require, if we're declaring them contraband of war, we're not required to return them. And that was the argument he used. And he wrote his memo about what he was doing to not only to Abraham Lincoln, but also to his commander, the Secretary of War, and he heard nothing. And a couple of weeks passed, and finally he got word, okay. And he got that from the Secretary of War. But by then, 
And this is a drawing, by the way, from his memoirs, which gives you, and I want to, I want to, let's see if I can go back. I want you to see the different perspectives. This particular drawing was published in Harper's Weekly. And this one was in Butler's memoirs, where he's trying to remember, of course, you see a less grand uh, environment. And this is probably more accurate, uh, the tiny little desk. In fact, if you walk into headquarters number one, and you turn to your left, to the room to your left, that room to the left looks like that. And so I'm more of the opinion that's probably what it looked like as opposed to that grand photo or illustration that was done by, in Harper's Weekly. And of course, the three men, Frank Baker, James Townsend, and Shepard Mallory, those three men then would enter into our history as being very important in starting a movement. They would start a wave. And you would see African Americans somehow hearing about this, knowing that these three men escaped to the fort and were allowed to stay. And, and after a while, tens of people came, and then a few hundred, and eventually thousands. Now what's interesting is once the army agreed that, they, that Butler could do this, as well as any commanders in the Union forces, they required four things. They required that they had to have been held in bondage. They required that, they, that whoever was their owner was in active rebellion. Now that was important because you had all the border states these are states that allowed slavery to continue, such as Maryland, but they did not secede. And so this idea of having the owner in active rebellion was important because Lincoln was terrified that the border states would secede if they thought he was trying to destroy slavery. Their labor had to be used in the act of rebelling against the nation and they had to um, be in possession. They had to actually make their way to the fort or to the troops. But Butler, soon after he made the declaration, was faced with another decision. And he would write later on in his memoirs. Actually, he would write in his letters to the government, to, to his boss, the Secretary of War, that for humanitarian purposes, he could not turn away the women and children and the older men. And so those individuals, while generally also referred to as contraband, the government would officially refer to them as refugees of war. Now these are the different steps that would be taken. Um, uh, we would see a conscription act. Uh, we would see the contraband act. And all of these different acts that Congress would pass would give more rights to these individuals who were being declared contraband generally, even though some of them were officially refugees. And what were some of those rights? Some of them, they would then have the right to be paid. They would have the right not to be returned to their owner. They would have the right to work uh, themselves and to be considered free labor. They would have certain limited civil liberties. And we would see a number of these men put to work immediately, building fortifications for the Union government, serving as laborers, and so forth. The biggest thing, though, um, the biggest challenge was fairness. Uh, the the uh, quartermaster's office, for example, was notorious for stealing all of the supplies that the contraband and the refugees were supposed to get, uh, replacing it with rancid meat or forcing them to pay, uh, not giving them wages, saying that they had, 
these were taxes, and so they had to pay them back. All kinds of, of heinous things happened during this period. And it wasn't unusual because the, the quartermaster's office was notorious for that, and blacks were faced with this. And if you read some of the documents, you know, for example, that the contraband camps were filled with so much misery. Um, the, the, the contraband camps here in Hampton Roads were not quite as bad as those, say, in Alexandria or other places in the country where people die by the tens every day. Here in Hampton Roads and Fort Monroe, their biggest challenge was fresh water. And in point of fact, the majority of the contraband never actually stayed at the fort. They stayed in the surrounding areas. And to help, uh, the Army asked one of the major missionary associations that was started by industrialists from New York, the Tappan Brothers. Um, they asked um, them to send someone down so that they could assess the situation and begin to help relieve the needs of the contraband. And Louis Lockwood was the first man to be sent down. And it's interesting because among the things that he would do, and I'll get back to Mary Peak in just a minute. He would marry a lot of people. And so I just compiled a short list. There were many more people than this that he would marry. Some of these couples have been together for years. There were a couple of the, there were two sets of couples who were actually black and white. Uh, the man was white and the woman was black. Um, many of them already had children. Um, but they wanted to be officially married. And by 1865, all of these marriages uh, and the records of these marriages would be communicated to the Freedmen's Bureau. And Virginia would actually pass a law saying that everyone who had been married, even in slavery, that marriage would be legally recognized, unlike a lot of other states where it wouldn't. Now, one of the first people that Lockwood would meet is Mary Peak, and some of you may know the story about her. She was a free black woman from Norfolk. Her mother was African, was a free black woman. Her father was an English merchant. Uh, I don't know that she ever met her father. She never talked about him. Uh, she would eventually marry a man uh, in Hampton who had been a slave, uh, but he too was was from all accounts half white and half black. In fact, he could pass for white um, and was used uh, as a spy for the Union uh, Army um, some years uh, or a year, I think, after his wife passed away. She would be the first person hired by the American Missionary Association in the South to be a teacher, and she would teach the contraband. And the reason that this tree, and this illustration was done uh, in the 1860s, and this picture was taken around 2000. Um, Emancipation Oak, the reason that tree was so important is because of the other illustration showing Mary Peak teaching young children under that oak tree. It would become an important gathering place, um, and it tells us that African Americans were already starting to to be public with how places were important to them, where objects were important to them. And they were beginning to clearly uh, tell the community, the broader community, how important those objects are. By the way, Emancipation Oak is a sibling of the oak tree at Fort Monroe, Algernon, which is about 450 years old. Emancipation Oak is a little over 400 years old. And the average life expectancy for these live oaks is 1,500 years. So it's still young, very young. And Hampton University, fortunately, is preserving that particular oak tree. And we know that the seedlings from that oak tree have been used um, to document important places in the African-American community. Now, 
where were some of these contraband? And I decided to point out a few places here. One of them, of course, here you have, here, here's Fort Monroe. And of course, right across the little bridge is the town of Phoebus that was, would be known as Slabtown. And then the, the, the village of Hampton would actually be the Grand Contraband Camp. And I don't know if you can really see it on this map. That's why I circled it. Here's an old map that actually tells you uh, Slabtown. And we would know later on, this is uh, an actual illustration, excuse me, not illustration, but photograph that was taken of Slabtown and that same drawing uh, that would be published in Harper's Weekly. And we also know that in Slabtown, the, the contraband hospital would be on Fort Monroe's uh, land. It would be on the campus, but it was right across the bridge from where Slabtown was located. And so there's at least the idea that the African Americans who were gathering in that Slabtown, it was called Slabtown because of all the pieces of wood that had been, that remained from burned Hampton Village were taken to build houses and, and shelters for the people who were gathering by the thousands on that particular land. And that slab town was, by the way, Camp Hamilton as well. That's where a number of the troops were placed. And I wanted to show you these pictures because the earlier pictures, I think, don't do it justice. There were homes that were actually built. And so when you go to the town of, or the section of Phoebus now, you will see some of the remnants of these um, better constructed houses. And that one that's the better constructed house was owned by Thomas Peake, the husband of Mary Peake. Now this just gives you a few statistics. We don't really know how many people actually came to Fort Monroe. Some of those documents are, have not yet been recovered, although Fort Monroe uh, is involved in a research project to try to gather all the documents. I suspect that there are somewhere buried in the quartermaster reports telling you the names of all the people. But just to give you a snapshot into what we believe is 1864, you're looking at just some of the, re of the people whose names or the numbers were recorded and the, the rations that were given out. And the requirement to live in any of these camps and to receive rations was that a male family member had to be enlisted in the military. And now this is a, a map of the Grand Contraband Camp. And if you go to downtown Hampton, you'll see streets like Union Street, Lincoln Street. It's because that was where African Americans rebuilt that town. That was their, the Grand Contraband Camp. Now, because I'm running out of time, I did want to mention a few other things. And that is, you all know about the famous battle of the ironclads, the Merrimack and the Monitor, or or more accurately, the Virginia and the Monitor. And everyone knows about blacks who served as troops, the United States colored troops. But what they don't perhaps know is that there were blacks who served aboard naval ships as well. And some of the first was this photograph of this man, Sia Carter, who was a, a slave on the Shirley Plantation who escaped and ended up serving aboard the, um, the Monitor. And there were several others, and some of them died when the ship uh, was destroyed. And the last thing I wanted, let me just go here. I want to take you all the way to near the end as I talk about the blacks who served in the army and give you a little information, just a little bit about the blacks who came from this area. We know that there were blacks who served in a, a host of different units and I'm going to mention them in a while. And this illustration, you can barely see it, but down here at the bottom, 
are the Union troops who were marching um, in the streets of Norfolk. We know that blacks were conscripted initially before the USCT was created. Uh, they were actually being enlisted as substitutes for whites. And it, they would actually uh, enlist in downtown Norfolk in the headquarters, the Union headquarters. There were a number of black troops who served, and I want to mention some of them. You had the, the 1st Regiment Cavalry that was organized at Camp Hamilton in December of 1863, and it was attached to Fort Monroe. You had the 2nd Cavalry, uh, Regiment Cavalry, that was organized in December of 1863 at Fort Monroe, also attached at Fort Monroe. You had the 2nd Regiment Light Artillery, ba Battery B, organized at Fort Monroe in 1864. You had the 1st Regiment Infantry, organized in Washington, D.C., but ordered to Virginia and attached to Norfolk and Portsmouth. So a number of people from Norfolk and Portsmouth enlisted in the 1st Regiment Infantry. You had the 4th Regiment Infantry, organized in Baltimore, but moved to Fort Monroe in 1863, and then to Yorktown. So you had African Americans all over that region enlisting. By the way, a number also came from the Eastern Shore to enlist. You had the 5th Regiment Infantry that was organized in Ohio at Camp Delaware, but was moved to Norfolk in 1863, and of course had a number of enlistees from this region. The 6th Regiment Infantry, organized at Camp William Penn near Philadelphia, moved to Fort Monroe, and then later to Yorktown in 1863. You had the 10th Regiment Infantry, organized in Virginia, attached in Drummondsville, Virginia. It was involved with a lot of incursions, and so everyone, generally from Hampton Roads, because I've looked at the list, there were people represented from the Hampton Roads region who were in the 10th. The 22nd Regiment Infantry, organized in Philadelphia, went down to Yorktown, Fort, and of course included men there. The 36th Regiment Infantry, uh, organized um, uh, in Norfolk and Portsmouth. The 37th organized and was from the North Carolina group uh, attached to Norfolk and Portsmouth and the 38th that was also organized in Virginia and attached to Norfolk and Portsmouth. And so you have then all of these incredible photographs and illustrations of African American men who served in these different regiments that I mentioned. And we have these illustrations telling you about, or at least giving you a snapshot of their activities. And I'm hopeful that this will be part of a larger project. In fact, I've been working for a few years gathering a lot of material, not only on the contraband camps in this area, but on, this, on these wars and how Hampton Roads played a significant role in the Civil War. Something that when you look at the Ken Burns documentary on the Civil War, you look at any documentaries on the Civil War, they seem to have ignored the most important issue. And that is not only the contraband declaration, but the fact that people from this region played an, an, a critical role in making sure that the Civil War ended up with a Union victory. I thank you all so much for your time and attention, and I will take questions. Are there any questions for me? Yes. You're, you're using dates for these forms, mostly 1863 and on. Did the Emancipation Proclamation spur Okay. He was asking me about the use of the date 1863 and the role of the Emancipation Proclamation in, in, in connection with that. And that was one of the things I quickly skipped over. But you're absolutely right, it did. Because the Emancipation Proclamation was a very legal document. Not as legal as the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that Lincoln issued in September of 1862, but pretty close. If you ever, ever read those documents, 
you know that a lawyer wrote them because it's difficult to understand and at times seems contradictory. Um, in the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, well, let me go back. In the preliminary one, Lincoln was basically asking the, or not asking, but demanding that the Confederacy lower its weapons and stop fighting. And he said, if you don't, then I'm going to call upon all the enslaved people to basically beat your butts. So you have until January 1st to lay down your weapons. Of course, he did not hear from them, and he knew he would be issuing this. The Emancipation Proclamation had a lot of exclusions, again, because Lincoln was afraid that the border states would decide to secede if they thought he was trying to destroy slavery. And so if you saw the film Lincoln, um, that gives you an idea of how resistant the border states were to ending slavery with the passage of the 13th Amendment. And so what he did was he included a lot of exclusions in the Emancipation Proclamation. So Norfolk, Portsmouth, they were excluded from being covered in the Emancipation Proclamation. Elizabeth um, City County, which is the Hampton area, that was also excluded. Any places where the Union Army had occupied that area were excluded. New Orleans was excluded. All the border states were excluded. So what he did was he said, okay, these places are excluded. However, I'm going to um, set up arm, an army, the United States Colored Troops, for all the areas that are not part of the exclusion, excluded areas. And these men from those non-excluded areas would come and actually serve in these, in these regiments that I will form, and I will form them by the end of 1863. And so the one that was issued in Janu on January 1st, 1863, he's telling everybody, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to do it, and all those in, in the states that are under rebellion, as far as I'm concerned, you're now henceforward and forever free. And of course, people didn't read the exclusions. And like a good lawyer, he knew they wouldn't read the exclusions or wouldn't pay any attention to it, which is why all these other acts had been passed to provide rights to anybody who was serving in the military and anybody whose families were serving in the military. So he constructed a set of acts and laws that would actually free many of the people who were in the South. So by the end of the war, virtually, African Americans were technically free. Um, but it would take the 13th Amendment to eliminate slavery altogether, so that many of them would not um, be re-enslaved at some point in time down the road. And so um, it would be in December of 1863 that we would see the actual formation of troops. Prior to that, in 1861 and 62, we would see contraband troops. And these are men who were in, enlisted in an unofficial capacity um, to go out and raid the plantations, uh, getting additional contraband so that they're pulling them out of and away from the Confederate forces to use. And they would gather these people around. In fact, when Norfolk had its celebration. It had the largest in the South. 5,000 people participated. Um, the Harper's Weekly said that there were black troops who were in that parade. And this was in January of 1863. And so there were some who were actually serving as contraband troops. And while they were not wearing uniforms, they were wearing certain garments that designated them in some way as troops. So I hope I've answered your question. Probably over answered. Yes. I don't have a question, but one of your uh, pictures up there, the watering of the mules, mm -hmm. uh, it had a date on there, 1963 instead of 18. No, it should have been 1863. That was my finger, thank you. <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Yes. Well, I just want to thank you for your work and your scholarship and for today's presentation. I mean, I think it's groundbreaking. My question is, um, what is being done to disseminate this 
information and integrate it into curriculum, um, not only in the Hampton Roads area, but certainly in the Hampton Roads area, because it certainly is a source of, of pride as well as information um, and across the state of Virginia. And certainly it's a task for the nation to truly understand this history. So she was asking what's being done to make sure that this history is known not only in Virginia but beyond. Um, I will say that there are uh, groups of historians who are working closely with uh, the Park Service, with Fort Monroe Monument to ensure not only that this history gets collected but it gets published. And um, so uh, one of the people, aside from myself, is Ed Ayers. Uh, who can command a lot of attention on matters such as this. Um, but you, you do have uh, the Park Service that's very committed to this. And, and as I said, uh, one of the suggestions, because I participated in a Scholars Roundtable a year and a half ago, uh, in which they were asking for our advice, and this is in conjunction with the Organization of American Historians, who's also a partner in this. Um, to give them suggestions about how um, they can make this history uh, relevant um, and known, and the role that Fort Monroe can play in interpreting this history. And one of the suggestions that it sounds like they're going to take is to gather all of these primary documents and, and have them there at Fort Monroe. So anything related to that, so it can not only be a mecca for historians coming and really going through this material, but it will also be a, a place where that material can be interpreted. And they are um, using a lot of our work to do more and more tours. In fact, they, are, they, they have really gotten a lot of interest from people about conducting tours at Fort Monroe and, um, and have plans for historical interpreters and other things there. And I think once that gets launched, then the other things will follow. Because you know that the standards of learning are very political. And, and I, I'm one of those, I'm not a supporter of the standards of learning at all. And I've said that publicly. <laughs> you know, I, I think that, I remember being involved about almost 20 years ago in a book project that was supposed to be for fourth graders. And the publishing company decided, because of some mess going on in Virginia, they decided they were not going to do the book. They said they weren't going to compromise on, on the quality of history. And so they just pulled back, they closed down the project. Um, and then this book appeared that had numerous errors throughout it. Um, and I think that there's, people don't understand, you cannot brainwash people into being patriotic because at some point they're going to find truth and it's going to create conflict. And patriotism really comes from your love of family and home. It doesn't come from a false sense of our history. I think that when we have and promote our shared history, that it becomes very interesting, it becomes exciting, and people see that change has happened and that we're working towards more inclusion. And that makes people proud. And when you hide that, then, then people don't care. And that's why you don't have people paying any attention to who some of the founding fathers were, who some of the founding mothers were. They don't pay any attention to the significance of 1619. They don't pay any attention to anything because it's irrelevant. Because then we've created these iconic images rather than these flawed human beings who lived in the past. And I don't know about you, but I'm a flawed human being. And I want to hear about other flawed human beings. Uh, and I want to know, what did these flawed human beings do to become important? You know, how did they make a difference in their world, even in their flaws? And, and I think that the SOLs, while it allows some flexibility, there's the other side, and that's the lesson plans that don't allow flexibility. And, and that's what's troubling to me. And I know it differs from city to city, but I've encountered too many teachers who told me 
that they couldn't even teach about the Emancipation Proclamation because there was no lesson on it. And I've gone to schools talking to the young people about the Emancipation Proclamation, and they were excited. They, were, they had so many questions, and that's what you want with history. You want young people to be excited about the past, so they ask questions. 